Right. And so what we try and do now is rid them of those excuses because someone has to break this cycle of fatherless homes. Mm -hmm. And so when guys come into our program, if they have children, they are our number one priority. And that's why we call it restoration. We want to start first by restoring the whole man's mm -hmm. and then restoring the family. And so that your son won't have the absence of a father because we're going to put you back into his life. Right. And so that's where our journey is, restoring the whole man, restoring the family, and breaking that cycle because your father left. You know how that made you feel, mm -hmm. and you know where that journey took you. So let's change that scenario. We are joined today by Dr. Jeffrey Parker, who is the executive director of Rod Ministries, and Rod stands for Restoration Outreach of Dallas, which is a nonprofit organization serving the prison population through the power of the gospel to repair, restore, and redirect broken lives in area prisons. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Parker. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we're excited. So let's get out in front of it. We're calling you Dr. Parker, or we're calling you Jeff. <laughs> Uh, Jeff is fine. That's what my Jeff, friends call me. Jeff yeah. is what your friend. We're, uh -huh. Look, he's going to call you Dr. I'm gonna Parker. Be, I'm going to be a respectful friend. I'm a friend. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm going to call you Jeff. <laughs> no, I'll call you Jeff. I'll call you whatever you want me to call yeah. you. <laughs> but I did want to read something real quick because I think this is, a, this is a great way to start as far as the ministry goes. But then we do want to go back and hear your personal story, where you're from, what your family life was like. How did you get here? What, what led you into wanting to serve this particular community, which is uh, those that are, that are currently serving time in prison. Um, but the stat that I saw on your website, which was fascinating to me, was of the 600,000 individuals released from prison every year, over 67% will return to a life of crime and imprisonment within three years. Mm. Mm. That is mind-blowing. That, yeah. that yeah. almost 70% of individuals who are released from prison will end up back in prison or reoffending within their first three years. Yeah. And, and it's, uh, you know, I, I come from a background where both my uncles did a, a lot of time, a lot of friends. I got a, my best friend did 26 years uh, in prison. And, and there's so much that we want to discuss. Um, uh, but first of all, we want to go back, Doc, and we want to go back. Now I'm calling him Doc, so I'm yeah, going to call you Doc. I'm sorry. So Doc. disrespectful. That's what it is. It's just, <laughs> he deserves to be called Doctor. <laughs> I'm going to call him Doc. Uh, let's go back to your childhood. Where, where were you born? What was uh, your childhood like? Mother, father? Uh, what was the fi family dynamics? I, I would say I had an amazing childhood. I am number 12 of 13 siblings. Oh, wow. <laughs> Same mother, same father, and uh, just a month ago, we just recently buried my first uh, sibling, so there's still 12 of us that mm. are alive and well, from Shreveport, Louisiana, went to school there, uh, born and raised there. Uh, just, I, I think I had the greatest uh, childhood. I had a father that, that took us to church every Sunday morning, but unfortunately for me, I wasn't born again, and I didn't mm. learn that till later on in life. And so I did learn that, you know, going to church don't make you a believer. Right. Having parents that take you to church won't make you a believer. It's a personal relationship with Christ. We're still very close to my sisters. I have eight sisters, <laughs> uh, one recently deceased, and four brothers, and we're still a very close tight-knit family. So Where do you the, fall in in that? In I'm, that I'm number 12. You are number 12. I'm number wow. 12, and I have a baby sister who thinks wow. she's my big sister. Uh, <laughs> we're still in love with each other, uh -huh. and that's where I spend most of my time when I go home now. I spend it with her because we were the last two right. uh, in this huge family that that we have. And so, and I really thank God for uh, just allowing me to be a part of such a, a family dynamics. When we hear 13 uh, in a family nowadays, that's almost scary. And mm. yeah. which, which made me really admire my father. When I became a father, I really admired his hard work. Uh, after five of us, I would have left, but uh, he, yeah, he, he stuck around and hey, he raised us he and did he provided put work. for us. Yes. He did put work. <laughs> he put in work. Well, think, <laughs> think about your poor mother, because I'm sitting here thinking 13 kids. Uh -huh. How old was the oldest when the youngest was born? Wow, that's amazing. So I, I was I was thinking about my mom the other day. Uh, 
So every year or every other year for 13 years, my mother was pregnant with a child. That, that's what I was going to say. Mm-hmm. How long yeah. your mother must have been pregnant or yeah. having a child is. And if you have kids, you know what toll that takes right. on the mother. I can't imagine 13. And I think that was just a different uh, time. Uh, Uh, Today, we don't even think about having that many children. I think it was just a different time. Um, My mom stayed at home with us all. My dad didn't make a whole lot of money, but I didn't know I was poor until I turned on the television and watched the Brady Bunch and they had upstairs (laughs) or something like that. But my dad did a fine job taking care of us. And so we didn't see ourselves as being poor. We saw ourselves as being uh, well taken care of. That's so funny because that's how that's how I judge people that had money or not when I was growing up. Did they have an upstairs right. or not? Yeah. That, that's what I thought. Do you was, even remember was the rich. Brady Bunch? Do you? I mean, ever, I know it. I just remember episode? the different boxes where they look up and down. I don't, yeah. I don't remember. Yeah. And I think they did an episode where the girl got hit in the nose and it broke her nose. That's the only. Right. That's, that's the only, the only one. I remember. I remember. No, let's go back. Let's, to the let's Brady go down Bunch. this let's rabbit hole. All right. Hole because I remember same thing. Inner city kid, mm-hmm. all, surrounded by predominantly black folks, and then and, and you know Hispanic. But turn on TV, and you watch the Brady Bunch, and you're like, "There is this is not life. <laughs> yeah, this is not. They they used to walk in the cupboard that actually have food. Right. You know, <laughs> they used to all sit down together. Right. And I'm like, come on, man. Did this is the furthest a, thing from reality that did there is. You just is. call it a cupboard. <laughs> <laughs> So How old are you? <laughs> <laughs> the pantry now. The cupboard. Yeah. yeah, that's all we had was a cupboard uh, back then. Let, let's, get back, <laughs> let's get back to your dad, though, because I, I don't want to over, you know, skate over the fact that he did stick around. Yes. That is super, that is a challenging, for both father and mother, but we do see that a lot, unfortunately, where fathers will, you know, le- end up leaving the family. What did your dad do? What, what, why was it so important for him to stick around? Uh, so my so my my father was a soldier, and mm. uh, after leaving the military, he took a job at a company in Louisiana called Frymaster. And I have a plaque that my father worked thirty three years with three days absence. Mm. Uh, and I guess if you had thirty three years, thirty three years, twelve kids, three uh, days. oh my thirteen gosh. children, thirteen children, yes. and only three absence. three absence in thirty three years. And that's one of the the uh, dearest. Um, tokens that my father could have left me because yeah. he had this work ethic and I think that's where I got it from I mean he was my superman um, mm. you know I, I tell everyone and I know you guys are big time football players but I've never bought a jersey with another man's name oh, on it for right. my children mm. I wanted them to see me like I saw my father he wow. was my my hero mm. and so I recall if if he worked for 33 years three days absence think of the number of days he went to work sick yeah. 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 Because in 33 years, I know there was those days when he really didn't feel like going, but because he was so obligated to his family, he pushed mm-hmm. through anyway. And so that gave me uh, no excuse for succeeding in life in anything that I wanted to mm-hmm. do because I had a beautiful role model right before me. So my dad's my hero. So you saw him every day get up. Every day. Get up, go to work. But not only that, my dad worked several jobs, very uh, well known throughout the community. Mm-hmm. Was one of the one guys that I would see go into a grocery store, fill a bag full of food, uh, take it to the register. They would ring him up and he would roll it out of the door. Uh, they knew that on Friday he would come back and pay for his food. And he mm-hmm. had relationships mm-hmm. like that throughout the uh, entire uh, Shreveport area. And so one of the things that I've learned from my father is I- I'm big on relationships. Mm-hmm. It, I, I don't like using drive through because you don't have relationship through a drive through. Mm-hmm. I-, I like face to face with people. And so right. that's one of the things my father taught me. Wow. Yeah. It's amazing how you can sit there and just off the cuff and, and, and not be, I mean, just just witness certain things that your father or your mother did and know how much value it is and how much of a lasting impression mm-hmm. that, that it possibly was. I, I can, you know, sit here and tell you, I, you know, I, I get emotional just listening to your story because there's so many people that don't have that in their lives, right? I didn't have that in my life. I had a mother who I witnessed go through that. Uh, it's a little different when you're when your father, who's a man, mm-hmm. um, lays it down and has shows strength in that way. It mm-hmm. Just it's the the family dynamics are totally different when that happens when they're both, um, you know, truly passionate about their kids. Were you were you aware at the time 
of the sacrifices and how hard he worked? Or is it something that you look back on now and you can really appreciate? Or were you aware of it then? I wouldn't say that I was aware of it. My father was a very tough man. He was a very strict man. We were not allowed to have company at our house. Mm -hmm. My father said there was enough of us there. <laughs> so we would hear his truck coming and all of our friends would just kind of scatter throughout <laughs> the neighborhood. And, right. you know, we laugh and talk about that even now when I go home. But I wasn't really aware of the sacrifice until I began to look back at the life lessons my father taught me. Then I began to realize I was wired the way that I was because of my father and the sacrifices that he mm -hmm. made. Uh, I don't think I fully appreciated him then like I do now. And I know that's kind of sad to say, but you know, as a, as a child growing up and a young man growing up, you just really thought that this guy has to be the worst person in the world. He's ruining my life. Mm -hmm. I can't even have worst. friends with yeah. this guy. So <laughs> I, I could, I wouldn't say that I was aware of his sacrifice at the time. Sure. How, right. how about that many siblings? Were you ever resentful at the time that you had so many siblings and maybe you felt lost or did you, how did you approach that? You know, um, having eight sisters and I was the, the youngest boy. I mean, I really loved my sisters, probably why I like women today. Mm -hmm. I'm married. Uh, sure, but sure. Uh, being with my sisters, it, I never resented having, I thought that was the norm mm. because the people down the street had 14 and the people up the street oh, had yeah. nine. And right. so up and down Myrtle Street, you had these big families. And so for me, I thought everyone came from a big family until I started meeting people that only had two or three. And I mm -hmm. actually felt sorry for them. How <laughs> <laughs> boring is that? Seriously. Just two of you guys? Right. Yeah. Really? Yeah. <laughs> so how was school? How, how were you in school as a student? Uh, I was extremely quiet in mm -hmm. school. The, my only joy, I, I did play high school football, mm. Uh, mm. defensive back. Yeah, oh, there you go. Uh, corner was, corner or safety? I, I played strong safety. I uh, wasn't really I good knew, at it. I knew but you that's why you're a doctor. Be. That's why you're a doctor. That's how brilliant you are. I, I get it now. I understand. Yeah. <laughs> but but I, I enjoyed school. I I later learned that my school ill prepared me for college, and that mm -hmm. was heartbreaking, and it was, it was uh, uh, really painful. Yeah. I, I left a, a predominantly black school, Booger T. Washington High School, and then I went on to uh, LSU, and that's when I learned, wow, I'm ill prepared for college. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting here, and I'm literally dumb yeah. compared right. to the rest of the students around me, and so we had to work extremely hard to kind of get caught up. Uh, so, yeah, I, I'm kind of angry at my high school uh, mm -hmm. for that, not because I didn't want to learn, but I, I felt that I was just ill-prepared for college. Mm -hmm. And we got, we're going to go down that road. Mm -hmm. We're going to go down that road because I think that there's something there because uh, it always feel uh, similar mm -hmm. in a lot of senses. When I got into college, felt like I was ill-prepared for what was right in front of me. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to go down that road because I think it, it – it, speaks to where we want to go as far as what you're currently doing now. Uh, but I want to go, okay, so you went into, you went to LSU. Mm -hmm. uh, what was that, what was your thought process going? You know, I knew you were going to go, you were going through the struggle, you figured that out, but what was, what did you want to become? Did you want to become a doctor then or was it something else? No, I wanted to become a business major. I, I kind of wanted to be able to direct my path. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I've done for my own children is i I would say to them, I'm not sending you to school to get a job. You don't need school to get a job. Mm -hmm. I'm sending you to school to create jobs. And so I've always done some type of business ever since I was in high school. I started out as the local DJ mm -hmm. and the business was doing really well. And I was able to hire some cousins and mm -hmm. so we could have multiple gigs or parties going on at the same time. But since my high school days, I've always ran some type of business. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to be a business major. I wanted to know the arts behind effectively running a business. And so that's the reason why I went to college. So where did the entrepreneur spirit come from? Was that your mom or your dad's side? A little bit of both. Mm -hmm. uh, my mom was in real estate later on in her mm -hmm. life. Uh, she had received a beautiful inheritance from an, an aunt and she took that money and she started in, investing in, in home ownership and buying and uh, renting homes. And so I saw that part of her and then my dad would work jobs and part-time jobs. Uh, and so it just kind of opened the door to a, a different light that I don't have to go and work for someone else. I could actually accomplish some things on my own because if I can make them rich, I might be able to make myself rich. 
Yeah. I love that. Love it. Go ahead. No, I just love the fact that you had that entrepreneur spirit coming up. Okay, so let's go. Let's go. I want to go through college. So give us college. Uh, four year. You're on a four year plan. You're on a seven year plan going through college. I was on the four year plan and I had a delayed entry program with the uh, United States Army. And mm-hmm. so I left college and I went into the Army. I did 13 years in the military. And that's oh, wow. how I ended up in uh, in Texas. My last duty station was uh-huh. here in Texas. And so from the um, um, regular Army, I joined the uh, Texas Army National Guard, mm-hmm. started training soldiers here. And after the first desert storm, uh, I decided that uh, I didn't want to be in the military anymore. I was going to try civilian life. And so mm-hmm. I ended up in the civilian sector. Okay, so you went to desert. Did you end up going to desert? Storm? Well, our, our, our team was called up, but the ground war ended in one day. And mm-hmm. so we didn't yeah. get to go. And we were very sad. Uh, contrary to what people believe, soldiers really want to go to war. Mm. And we were prepared, but we didn't have to go. And so I didn't make uh, the first desert storm. So did, were you stationed? Did you end up going to Kuwait? As a holding base, or no, we 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 held up at Fort, Fort Hood Fort, okay. uh, because the advance party was already there. So we were right. at Fort Hood, okay. and when the uh, the war ended as mm-hmm. quickly as it did, we got a stand down. So my unit did not get to go. Okay, all right. So you get out. Of, you're in the military. Thirteen years. Have, have you? Are you married at the time? Did you? Uh, no, I didn't get married till after the military. Um, I took a job. Once I got off of active duty to, mm-hmm. at United Parcel Service, and uh, that's where I first laid eyes on my wife. Believe it or not, the first day I saw her, uh, I said these words, and words are powerful. Man, I'm gonna marry that girl. Come wow. on, man. Hey, first God, day, God, we've heard that before. <laughs> now, seriously, did you honestly feel that way? That was the first time you saw her. That. She was the one. Love at first sight. Didn't know anything about her. And I saw her walking across the, what we would call the crosswalk. And I said, I'm going to marry that girl. Well, little did I know that four years later, we were working in what they call the same center, um, Package Car Center. Mm-hmm. And I got an opportunity to just kind of slide her my name. And I think I wore Wait, out. Four, four years after you saw her for the first time yes. was when you finally got to slide her your name? Yes. That's a long time to be thinking. L- Yes, That's and my wife. I stayed single all that time, and wow. finally, I just wore down. I kept axing her out, and she kept saying no, and I kept axing her out, and and so one morning we both was off work at the same time, and I asked her if she wanted to go bowling, and she said yes, and so oh, I wow. took her bowling, and the rest was history. What what yeah. made her say yes after all this time? I wore down. <laughs> just she was like, he's not going away. I'm not going away. <laughs> I might as well say yes. I'm just going to keep axing. Yeah. Right, See, yeah. nowadays we call that stalking. And <laughs> well, it, it truly was. Uh, it truly it, was. It, it truly was. But I believe that's. Uh, you know, there was those little hints around along the way that she kind of wanna, mm-hmm. you know, go out with me. I just got to keep axing her. That that's the vibe that I was getting. Good for and you, so man. She's still my wife today of 29, 29 oh, years. Man, that's, wow. So that's awesome. yeah, we have uh, five children. Uh, one in heaven. Uh, we, our firstborn daughter passed away, um, with cancer, but we mm. still have a, a healthy, uh, relationship. Mm. Yeah. yeah. God bless, man. Yeah. God bless. So let, let's go into what you are currently doing now. How, how did you get involved in the ministry? Well, uh, man, this is a, a, a funny twist. So in the military, uh, you know, having been raised in the church, in the military, I started studying Islam. Mm-hmm. And so while in the military, I was walking as a Muslim for eight years. Wow. Ah, okay, so wait a minute. Let's go back. Mom and dad, the way you grew up in, in Shreveport, Christian family. Christian family, Methodist church. When the Parkers showed up, we took a, a pew and the next one. Uh, <laughs> uh-huh. We were there, and I went to church, oh, 18 years of my life from the mm. time I was born until I left home. Um, went into the military, uh, got introduced to Islam while in the military, and started walking as a Muslim for eight years while I was in the military. It wasn't until I met a pastor working at UPS, 
and we would talk over a CB radio. He would talk about uh, Christ and God in the Bible. I would talk about Muhammad and the Quran, mm -hmm. and we would have these debates back and forth. It was a beautiful story because we were driving from Dallas, Texas, Mesquite, Texas, mm -hmm. the hub there, to Louisiana, where I was born and raised and first got introduced to Christ. And so I was going back to where I got introduced to Christ, but having these long debates about Christianity and Islam. And one night, I, I tell people this, that um, some people are saved in a truck, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, in a church. Mm -hmm. I was saved in an 18-wheeler. One night, I, I cried out to the Lord, Lord, if what this man is saying is true, uh, save me. And he did. Uh, and so mm -hmm. it was from that experience, the only person that I knew who went to church was my brother-in-law. And so I started attending church there. He was the one that challenged me after a year or two to go on what they call a Bill Glass Weekend of Champions. Mm -hmm. um, Bill Glass does prison ministry all over the United States. And so I went on a weekend of champions. And one of those weekends, just being in the prison with those guys, I, I, I wondered what happened to these men when they get out of prison. Mm -hmm. So the next weekend of champions that I went to, I met a man who told me about an organization that had just recently got started, Restoration Outreach of Dallas. They go into prison every week, but their desire was to walk along beside men when they are released from prison, and that hooked me. Mm. From that time on, uh, I got involved with this ministry. It was two years um, old at the time, and so I just got involved as a volunteer going into the Hutchins State Jail, uh, ministering to those guys, and then when those guys get out, we have an opportunity to kind of walk along beside them. Mm -hmm. Little do people know, when you look at the relationships between father and sons, most of the men who are incarcerated didn't have a relationship with their father, father. their biological father. Mm -hmm. They didn't know who he was. <clears throat> Well, since I had such a great father, I thought I had something to offer. Mm. And so I have uh, literally become the father to those men who are fatherless and just teaching them mm. uh, things that a father would have taught them had they been in a relationship with father. So at Restoration Outreach of Dallas, we go into the prisons. Uh, we're in five area prisons. Um, we minister to the men while they're in prison. Then we help those men transition from prison back into community. So for you, you said you were hooked. What was it about it? That, that, did you have any experience with the prison system growing up? Did you, were you ever in and out of jail, friends, family, anything like that? Never had any experience with the prison at all. I had handcuffs on me once when I was in the military for something I totally didn't do. But that was my only experience. Uh, but the thing that, that really hooked me was the fact that I felt that in some small way I could help these men uh, through the journey that they're going through. I thought that the gospel had equipped me enough to be able to step in and help those guys transition back into the community. And this organization had that goal and they had that desire. And so as a volunteer, I was able to help. And then later on, they would ask me to come on staff. Mm -hmm. And so I, I worked as the director of aftercare. My job was to assist those men when they came home. And then two years later, I became the executive director of Rod Ministries. Do you think if you weren't walking in faith that you would have actually got involved with uh, the outreach program? Not at all. It's my faith because prisons is a dangerous place. Right. It's my faith that enabled me to go into prisons in the first place. Because, yeah. you know, I don't want to say that when my cousin asked me, he did for me what I did to my wife. He just wore me out uh -huh. and I ran out of excuses. I mean, this guy would literally ask me every other month to go into prison with the go. And I spent my whole life trying not to go to prison because yes. my father said that's the one yes. place he's not coming to get me. <laughs> yeah. So raising boys, you know, we spend our life not going to prison, and now mm -hmm. I spend my every day going into prisons. Yeah. yeah. That was, wow. I would say, you know, there, there was always those scared straight programs that you see on TV and the D.A.R.E. programs and whatnot. The experiences that I had are going to go see my, my uncle, and my, his name was Uncle Sam. Sam was in <laughs> Florence, and Florence in, in Arizona, is they call it the wall. Mm -hmm. And going through those gates and when they close those gates, this is just on visits. When they close those gates behind you, it is, it is the most eerie feeling ever. Like freedom is gone. And, and I was just as a visitor walking through the gates with my mother to go visit. And I can't tell you, it was the reason why I said, there's no way 
you know, look, I, I, I may not be perfect, but I'm not going to spend my time here. And it, it's what really, you know, scared me straight. So for you to make this sacrifice is, you know, first of all, I got, we applaud you for, mm. for doing so. But for you to make this sacrifice, this is not a, about Dr. You know, Jeff. This is about actually serving these young men and, and giving them hope. Do you think hope is one of the reasons why they're, they're, they're in the situations that they're in currently? You mentioned uh, a program called Scared Straight. Um, our philosophy is to love them straight. Mm, uh, mm. because that's the thing that's it's missing. Uh, hope is one of those things that's missing. Uh, I have a young man, I'll just call him uh, Darren. He um, a good name. went to prison on death row at mm. 17 years of age, mm. right here in the city of Dallas. Um, spent the next five years on death row, um, s- Something happens where he's moved off of death row. Uh, he ends up in my program. Mm-hmm. Uh, he spends 34 years in prison. Now, mind 34. you, when I met him, it was 10 years ago, but 34 years, starting out mm-hmm. at 17, starting his life journey when he should have been going into college or, or finding a job. He's on death row, and mm-hmm. he's, he's going to die, according mm-hmm. to man, but God change that around. And so he walks out of prison, having been in our program. Uh, not only was he a student in our program, we also trained those men up to teach. Mm-hmm. And, and that brings them hope. Uh, and then he's released to me. We have an aftercare program where if those men are going to go back into homelessness, that's a direct pipeline back into prison. So he's released into our program. And so now we're searching to find a job for a guy who's been incarcerated for mm. 34 years. Wow. Uh, who has never had a legal job, Mm -hmm. nothing to put on a resume. And so as God would have it, we found a company here that hired him as a security guard because we convinced them that he's been watching security and he knows security for Mm. 34 years. So we use that as his resume, gainfully employed. Now, that's hope. Right. That's hope. So his story goes back into the prison to guys who are waiting to come home. Uh, the pandemic stopped us from going into prison, but it didn't stop the prison from sending guys home. Mm-hmm. So we were still receiving guys during the midst of the pandemic, and these guys were still uh, being gainfully employed, even in the midst of the pandemic. So we had about 21 guys in our program. None of those guys are, were without jobs, even mm-hmm. in the midst of the pandemic. Mm-hmm. So what are you seeing? Let's go back on this, because you're, 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 you're taking in um, – Prisoners that have that are coming out, right? Yes. You're providing those resources and hope. Let's talk about those kids that are young kids, 14. I mean, even earlier than that, that are in the juvenile system, and then they they're coming up uh, just through the system. You know, what is it? What do you think is the instigating issue? What what's instigating that issue that they're going into the juvies early, the juvenile? Uh, juvenile centers early and then possibly to jail or to prison? Well, you know, there's this pipeline that used to uh, go from high school to college. Right. That pipeline is now diverted to prisons. And I think our school system have a lot to do with a lot of young men who are ending up in our juvenile systems. I believe our communities have a lot to do with those young men. And so having looked at the age of young men going into prisons, because I see them there at 17 and 16 years of age Mm. in an adult prison, we started a program called In the Trend. And what we wanted to do is to get involved with those young men who are going to the juvenile courts, who the school have already deemed uh, that they're going to not make it in school. So we start intersecting those lives to prevent them from going into the prison system. So I can't say it's just one thing. I mean, there's the, the community has to get involved. Our schools have to get involved. Law enforcement have to get involved. We can't just lock young men up yeah. and say that's the solution. Mm-hmm. We have to come up with better alternative for these young men who may not make it in a school system. When I was growing up, we had trade schools. Mm -hmm. They've done away with trade schools. And and we have to realize not every young man is going to be a candidate for college. So if we gave him a trade, then he'll be able to take care of himself. But if not, then if he doesn't graduate, do you know that they start building 
prisons based on third grade reading scores. Wow. What? Yes. If, if they're not reading on, on grade, then the chances of them going to prison are very high. If they can't read in third grade, mm. yes. it has a direct correlation if they end up in prison or not. Yes. Mm. Oh, my gosh. Man. So what you're saying is they're building these prisons in communities where it's lower education based on what you just said there. Well, and then when you put profit behind it, we mm-hmm. have for-profit prisons, prisons. now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there is an incentive to keep people locked yeah. up. And it's so amazing to me. If you visit the local um, animal shelter, right. they have air conditioner. You visit the local prison, these guys are sitting in dorms at 110 degrees in Texas. Mm. Uh, and yes, these are some bad guys. No one asked them to go to prison. Um, we've all made mistakes. Mm. And sometimes the difference between uh, one person getting incarcerated over another one is their resources. Uh, some people have money. They don't go to prison. If you don't have money, you're going to prison. But even though men and women make mistakes, we still should treat them in a humane way. Yeah. We would lock a person up for treating a dog that way, but yet it's okay to treat prisoners that way. Mm. Uh, all of my friends are felons. Mm. All of them. Uh, I've spent the last 20 years of my life, but I see what God can do when he changed the hearts. Most of these young men never had a chance. Mm -hmm. And I used to think that, you know, you you have an opportunity. You know, let's let's go on that because Mm -hmm. there's a lot of arguments on the opposite side. Mm -hmm. Because I hear the, 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 the opposite side of, well, we all have a chance. We live in America. Everybody's on equal footing. Yes. No, let's talk about that because I, I'm a firm believer that not everyone has equal footing uh, moving forward. But, but the other, other side of it is we live in a free country. We all have access to, to an education. We all have, can make a decision not to get in trouble. You know, let's talk about that. Uh, and you, you mentioned the word access to an education. That may be true, but what is the quality of that education? Right. Uh-huh. So when I moved to Dallas, not knowing anything about Dallas, I had an aunt that lived in South Dallas. They called it Dixon Circle. Mm-hmm. First place that I was introduced to when I came to Texas. And I, when you asked me, did I go to war? Yes, yeah. I went to war. Mm. But then I looked at wow. what was available in that community. It, there's, a, there's a food desert there. You can't even find <sighs> good Man. quality food. And, you know, I travel all over the world. I'm a church planner. Mm-hmm. So we've planted over 55 churches in Africa. And I've seen better food in Africa than I've mm. seen in the southern region of Dallas, Texas. Mm-hmm. So I used to think everyone had a chance. But what if every choice you have is a bad choice? Mm. So there, there is not, okay, you have this good choice, and then you have this, 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 this better choice. What if every choice is bad? And mm. when we look at some of the choices that some of these young men have to make uh, to survive in our inner cities, uh, I, I wouldn't say that everyone has a level footing. That's just not true. Mm. You mentioned earlier fathers playing such a big role mm-hmm. and, and present fathers. What, what's the correlation there? Why is it so important to have an active, present father in the home as far as your future dictates? Well, I think for me, I would have to go back to God's intention. God intended that each, each household or each family unit has a representation of a mother and a father. Um, most of our fathers in the inner cities have been pulled out for whatever reason and are in prison or are no longer a part of the uh, family dynamics mm-hmm. for whatever reason. And that's why I say that the men in the community, like myself, We need to step up because we can become fathers to those young men who don't have fathers and give them another alternative. That's why gangs are so attractive. It gives these young men some sense of family, some Mm -hmm. sense of belonging. And so what I decided to do is to step up and become a father to those in the inner city. So I take a group of young men to my house. I live in the suburbs, but I'm moving back into the inner city. Now Mm -hmm. we're building a home uh, in what's called the bottom district. We just broke ground on last week. Mm. It's right at uh, 35 in Colorado. So I'm moving back into the inner city. But when I took those young men to my house in in the suburbs, the first thing they thought was, "You you sell dope? 
Because yeah. everybody mm. they know that have anything is mm. a dope, dope seller, dealer. Oh, a dope okay. dealer, right? And so I believe that it, we could show them a different way. We can show them something better. And so I use a lot of the guys in our program who's been arrested for drugs, went to jail, have came out, and they've taken a nine-to-five job. I use those guys to talk to the guys in the inner cities now, especially young men, about their journey with the hopes that these young men don't take the same steps or or go down the same path mm-hmm. with the absence of a father who's supposed to be your protection, your guidance, your counselor, the security blanket of so many of those young men have just been ripped apart. And so they find a father and those that they see in the community that might not mm-hmm. be the best example of what a father should be. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Darren and I talk about this. What are you exposed to? What, what is your experience in life? What do you see on a daily basis? And so we're talking about, you know, not everybody has an equal opportunity. That's true because what do I grow up in? What's my environment? Is my father present or not? And if he's not, what are my buddies doing? They're out running the streets. Well, I'm probably going to do that because I've never been exposed to anything else. How can I be expected to be doing anything else? So that's the fascinating thing is when you've never experienced that personally, you just think, well, everybody's got a chance. Everybody's good. I I grew up with both my parents. Why can't everybody figure it out you know what i hear pull themselves up by the bootstraps yeah but i hear it on the opposite side i grew up and my father wasn't as involved in my life my mother was you know one who basically raised us and i always hear people say well you know you grew up in a single family household how did you make it you know you made Mm -hmm. it well i made it use you as an example use me as an example look my dynamics are totally different than you know everyone else's we're and we're all different but the one thing I did have was that my father did come around every once in a while. Right. And my mother was in a position of strength and respect. And she taught us and she spent time. And it was an ultimate sacrifice right. that she put in to make sure we stayed the straight and narrow. And church, and like you said, church was a big part of that. Mm-hmm. You know, we had a foundation. And I go into the inner city and I speak to a lot of kids and you don't see the foundation. And it's so sad that when, when you hear the opposite side speak about how, you know, everything is fair, all you have to do is go down to South Dallas, go or go to West Dallas and see these children and then put yourself in a position to, to really like yeah. be empathetic to understand that things are not. It, it's sort same. of like me saying, I played High school football, yeah. why didn't I make it? I mean, I didn't make it to the Cowboys. Mm-hmm. And my father was very much a part of my life, right. but I didn't make it to the Cowboys. Mm-hmm. And so when, when you look at it from that perspective, uh, I don't think that, and, and true enough, one of the things that I try to teach my guys is, okay, men, uh, no more excuses. Mm-hmm. Your father was not there. Mm. Uh, your mother uh, was probably not the best mother. You probably mm-hmm. didn't get the best education so what right now what right Mm -hmm. now what are we going to do um uh, and and so from that perspective we begin to look forward Mm -hmm. and my past kind of fueled uh my journey going forward the fact that i've spent time in prison there are employers out here who will now give you a job Mm. And you know the pain that you went through not having a father then become the father to your children that you didn't have. Right. And so what we try and do now is rid them of those excuses because someone has to break this cycle of fatherless homes. Mm -hmm. And so when guys come into our program, if they have children, they are our number one priority. Mm -hmm. And that's why we call it restoration. We want to start first by restoring the whole man's Mm -hmm. and then restoring the family. And so that your son won't have the absence of a father because we're going to put you back into his life. Right. And so that's where our journey is, restoring the whole man, restoring the family, and breaking that cycle because your father left. You know how that made you feel, and mm-hmm. you know where that journey took you. So let's change that scenario. I want to take a quick break from this episode with Dr. Jeffrey Parker and Darren was calling him Jeff and Doc the whole time, so we don't want to be disrespectful. Dr. Jeffrey Parker. Dr. Hope you guys, <laughs> Jeffrey Parker, for sure. Hope you guys are enjoying the conversation. want to take a quick second to thank our sponsor, Choctaw Casino and Resort. Uh, it's here. Oh, yeah. The new casino, the Man. new resort, it's all open. It is here. If you haven't been up there yet, get yourself up I-75 to Durant, Oklahoma. Check out the new resort, D. 
What you got? The the casino is fabulous. We walk that. It's unbelievable. All new equipment. I mean, I tell you what. It, it I think they have a million, a million, one million slot machines. Oh yeah, and, and brand new. <laughs> That's an official number. One brand, million, <laughs> brand new. It feels like I'm telling you, everybody wants to go to Vegas now. You go, just go down to Choctaw Casino Resort. You'll get that Vegas feel. The spa is unbelievable. The steakhouse, the wife and I are going to absolutely enjoy the steakhouse. And I'm talking about the best of the best, one of the best chefs in Texas altogether or, or nationally uh, in, in there cooking them up. I, I just – look, time away, right down the way, maybe an hour ride for mm-hmm. us, it, it's going to be unbelievable, and I can't wait for the opening. Yeah, it feels like you're in a whole different world yes. up there. So get yourself to Chautauqua Casino Resort. Now back to the episode. So the, is, the fa- is it based on the foundation being of Christ? Of, uh, is it basically, are, how are you going into the prisons? Are, are we talking like Bible studies or how, yeah, what are yeah, you let's, doing? Let's lay, it, let's lay it out for me now. And, and I want to feed off this question, Darren, but there's a stat that, that you guys were t- talking about on your, um, on your website it says the national rates of recidivism. Now, that's a big word. I'm not sure I said Citivist. that right. You said it right. All right. There we go. <laughs> it, that means basically the tendency of a criminal to reoffend. I had to look it up. I never heard that word before. Mm-hmm. Is 70%. Yes. So the tendency for the, for the national average is to reoffend is 70%. Those who complete the Rod Ministries program is 5%. So to Darren's question, yeah. let's set this up. How does the program work? Who's eligible for the program? Talk to us from there. So, and uh, we go into prisons that, and and I thank God for Texas prisons because they open the door for ministries to come in. Mm. So the foundation of our whole program is Christ-centered. We come from different churches, different backgrounds. We have volunteers that from all over North Texas Mm -hmm. that go into the prison with us, and we teach uh, Four curriculums. The first curriculum is called New Beginning. It's basically a Bible study for beginners. Mm. That's where our journey is. But our ultimate goal is to foster relationship because we want to continue to walk with those men when they get out of prison. So when they first come into the very first class, we give them what's called an exit interview because what we want to do is begin to start planning their exit from prison from day one. Mm -hmm. We want to be proactive. And so they do 12 weeks in that class, and each class graduates into the next class. So they go from new beginnings to new foundation. And we're teaching uh, a Bible. We're teaching uh, theology. And Mm -hmm. so the new foundation class goes a little deeper into theology. Some of the men may be Christians. Some of the men may not be Christians. But our class is open to anyone who wants to come to the class. They Mm -hmm. do know it's a Christ-centered class. Mm -hmm. And so it's a voluntary class, uh, not mandated by the prisons. Um, The next class we teach is New Freedoms. And New Freedoms is one that I really love. There's two books that we use along with the Bible, Victory Over Darkness and Bondage Breaker, written by an author, a Neil Anderson, and that kind of helped those guys get through some of the strongholds of their life. From there, there's a fourth class that we teach called Abiding Fathers. So we actually teach a fatherhood class. Mm, mm. Once those men go through all of those classes, uh, most of them are eligible for parole or maybe getting out of prison, but it doesn't matter. Whenever they get out of prison, our desire is to be here when they get out of prison. So the same people that they saw while they were incarcerated, other people that picks them up at the bus station in downtown mm. Dallas and take them either to their own home or if they don't have a home, we have three transitional homes here yep. in the city of Dallas. And so our uh, initiative is a faith based initiative. However, if a guy's a Muslim and he wants to come to a Bible study, we say come. Mm -hmm. If he's a Muslim and he doesn't have a house to go to, we say come. Mm -hmm. So we don't close the doors uh, because they are of a different faith Mm -hmm. because we believe that what we have to offer works no matter what your faith is. Our faith happens to be in Christ. Mm -hmm. We know that the difference that we're making is in Christ and in Christ alone. And so when you talk about uh, from 5 to 11% recidivism, we're saying that when guys come through our program, they don't go back to prison. Wow. So, so talk to us about those phases again. And I think you said it's all voluntary. So anybody yes. can, there's no prerequisites, no nothing. nothing. Anybody can join. Anybody can join. And so what we do is uh, the chaplains will put out when the classes are mm-hmm. going to start. 
uh, and the guys will sign up for the classes, and then they'll come to class. For instance, we're working in Tennessee Colony on the Cofield unit and the Michaels unit, and so we'll say that the class is going to begin down there. It's on Mondays at 1 o'clock, mm-hmm. and so we'll have an auditorium, and we'll pack that auditorium out. We have a waiting list for every prison mm. that oh, we're wow. in for guys wanting to get into the class. Mm. Uh, yeah. Mm. So what what do you, go ahead. No, 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 you go ahead. No, yeah. so are you seeing this? Has is, is has there been a lot of growth in this process? Are you seeing this continuous continue to grow? Oh, without a doubt. Uh, my heart's desire is to be in every place there is a prison. Mm-hmm. Mm. Uh, so if there is a prison, we want our ministry in that place. Uh, if it was not for the pandemic, we would be in 10 prisons in North Texas. But we're going to do something called Rod in a Box, where we want to train other organizations because we know that we have a program that works both inside of prison and outside of prison. We want to train other organizations that has a desire to work with men while they're in prison or to work with men when they are coming out of prison. Not many ministry do both of them. Right. Some, some ministry will just go inside of prisons, and that's great. But where those guys really need us is when it's time to come home. And so our organization, we decided to continue that relationship. So I don't want to just love on you while you're in prison. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to walk with you when you get out of prison. I was in one of our homes last night, and we have some of the greatest cooks, some of the greatest plumbers, some of the greatest electricians that's come out of prison. And uh, one of the guys, I call him Mr. Webb, he cooked dinner for me last night. Uh, mm-hmm. Fried chicken, green mm-hmm. uh, greens, collard greens, right. cornbread, rice. And I spend time in all of these houses with these guys, mm-hmm. and I consider them my sons. Mm-hmm. And so I spend time with my sons. And I literally tell these guys, uh, I have three biological sons. Every right that is afforded to them are afforded to you. Mm. Because not only you're my son, you're my brother in Christ. And I want to see you do better. And so these guys, they come out and they do better. So what does it look like if you don't have, you come out of prison and you don't have these type of resources? What does that look like? What is that predominantly? What does it look like? Who's picking you up? Walk us through that. Well, if if you don't have family, and most of these guys have burnt their bridges, Mm -hmm. that's why the recidivism rate is so high in Texas, because if you don't have family and you're released from prison, now parole says that you got to have a place to go to. And so either they'll try and find you uh, a a place to go to. Uh, I would love for you guys to to come and visit one of our transitional homes. They Mm -hmm. are immaculate. Mm. Uh, And the guys, uh, really, we take really good care of our properties. But if you don't have a place to go to, eventually you'll end up in homelessness. Mm. And homelessness is a direct pipeline back into prison Mm. if you talk to the average inmate he have done this at least four or five times before he gets it right Mm. if he doesn't have organizations like restoration uh, outreach of dallas stepping in filling in the gaps before them uh, we don't really think about the mountain of things that these guys have to go through Mm -hmm. uh, when they get out for instance if you've been locked up 34 years you don't have a clue how to get on the train system. Yeah. You don't have a clue how to work a computer to fill out a yeah. job application. And what do I need to do to get social security cards mm-hmm. and ID cards? Our organization comes in and we take care of all of that groundwork for you. Uh, we take care of your medical as well as your physical uh, needs, uh, your mental needs as well. So all of our guys get a mental once over to make sure that the mental capacity of these men, and you know, we talk about uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome mm-hmm. for soldiers. Every guy released from prison goes through it. Mm-hmm. And we never look at that, and we wonder in society, well, why do he reoffend? We never look at the, the mental uh, shock that these guys go uh, through when they get out of prison. When I pick guys up, you know, the speed limit is 75, so we drive about 80 now, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I hope I'm not the only one. But these guys <laughs> haven't been in a car going that fast yes, in yeah. 30 years, so you can see them holding right. on. But we never considered one guy we had to teach how to use a washing machine. Those Everything that we take for granted day to day, one yeah. guy thought that the microwave was a TV. We take for granted that these guys are going to come out knowing all mm-hmm. of this stuff. And if they don't have people to walk along beside them once again, then they're not going to be successful. Yeah. So yeah. what are you able to do with them in when they're in prison? Obviously, ministry and, and the gospel is a big part of it. But what else are you able to 
speak with them about? You know, you mentioned these guys don't even know how to use a washing machine. Are you able to teach them other life skills, or is it mostly uh, gospel focus while they're in there. So there are other classes that the men take that, uh, prepare them for certain like life skills. Not everyone that's released is going to be released to North, North Texas. So during our exit interview process, we try and find out the zip code that he's going to go to. Right. That way we can give him a packet of organizations in that zip code that would do some of the same things that we can do for him. And so he's handed that packet when he leaves prison so that when he goes back to that zip code, let's say he's going back into the Houston area, uh, he'll have a packet with organizations that are going to be able to help him. They all, they are expecting his call because we've already gone before him to kind of paint that Mm. way. So it's not, uh, they have to come to our program. We want to make sure that they have assistance no matter where they go in the state of Texas. Uh, for that matter, anywhere else. We had a young man just recently uh, was in our program. He was getting married in New York. He says that, you know, Dr. Parker, you are the reason my life has changed. I want you here on my big day. Mm. And so I jumped on a plane. I went to New York, and I was there with him when he married his lovely bride. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it's it's things like that, that that keeps me going when I can see uh, true life change. And so no matter where they go throughout the world, we want to continue to be that partner. We want to continue to be there for them. Yeah, I was just going to ask that. How, how long after their release are you guys involved? I'm sure to some degree, but formally, I guess, would be a better question. How long are you formally involved with these guys when they're... I would honestly say from the prison to the grave, because I've mm. buried a, a many number of guys who have come through the prison, was doing great in life, but didn't have the best health care, mm. uh, and would soon... Uh, pass away and so we're there for them and their family Um, so we're really serious and intentional about spending time with these guys no matter what that was going to be a question I did have about health Mm -hmm. in in general if you're just going to you know make a general statement what is the health system like for these guys that are in in prison and then coming out I mean obviously I can't I can't imagine it's that great but they get paid a lot of money but the health care in prison is not all that great it, it, it's not. And so that's why we take it. Thank God for programs like the Parkland Plus plan. So when guys come out of prison, mm. we can get them signed up in that in the Parkland Plus plan. But other than that, the health care in prison, it's not all that great. You right. know, they, they do what they can, mm-hmm. but it's not all that great. And so that's always a big issue. Uh, drugs is also a big yeah. part mm-hmm. of the prison community and the prison population. Mm-hmm. And when you're no longer using drugs yeah. anymore, remember the drugs kill all of the warning signs that something is going on. And when mm-hmm. you're no longer on those drugs anymore, uh, the health issues tend to multiply. Oh, right. Mm-hmm. You know, I always looked at not only that, but, you know, the drug issue that, that it continues within the prison. Yes. I mean, that, that, those issues continue. People think like, well, you know, you're in prison now, you don't see the drugs and you're not. No, it's, it, it continues. What about a trade? I mean, are, 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 is there something that's, is there programs that are in prison that allows them to learn a trade while they're in prison? So when they do get out and use your resource and now they can go get a job? Uh, yes, there are several programs that the guys uh, go through while they're in prison that prepares them mm-hmm. for life after prison. For instance, when guys are in, my, in our program, we kind of dig into their lives. If they didn't get a, a high school diploma, we make sure, why don't you get your GED while you're in prison? I mean, you have time. Yeah. So there's no excuse for coming home without having your GED. But there are uh, several programs that the guys do in prison, and some of them they can even pick up on when they get out of prison. So there was a couple of guys in our program that uh, was in AC while they were in prison, the headback community. And so when they got out, we sent them to class while they were out. uh, And then they both got beautiful jobs Mm -hmm. uh, doing that once they got out. So there there are several resources in prison if the guys choose to do their time wisely. Once they come in contact with our ministry, we try to encourage them, if they're not involved in getting a trade while they're in prison, we try to encourage them to get involved while they're in prison, and they can have that behind them when they get out of prison. All right. Oh. You know, we. I just think about the prison system in general. You, you mentioned earlier you want to be in every single prison. So before I ask this next question, how many prisons are there in the country? Oh, my God. I, I don't know. A lot. There is a <laughs> lot. Okay. 
So I, I think about my kids when I punish them. The goal of the punishment is that they learn, and they, I, I teach them a lesson they learn. So that's, I guess, how I think of, of prisons. Uh, what, I mean, is that the goal of, of prison is to truly rehabilitate, or is it more just a punishment, hey, stick them away, forget about them? I mean, I would think the best path would be to rehabilitate, and, and it sounds like that's what you guys are doing, obviously. Well, rehabilitation used to be a big part of prisons. You really don't see that much in the literature of prison anymore. But what they've done was they've opened the doors where nonprofit organizations can come inside a prison. And it's really a win-win for them. So if Mm -hmm. I have these guys for two hours in a class, officers are not being assaulted. Mm -hmm. Uh, These guys are doing something that is going to be meaningful uh, to them. And so I do applaud the Texas prison system for opening the doors and allowing a nonprofit organization. It doesn't cost them a penny. They don't have Mm -hmm. to spend one dime to have us come in. Mm -hmm. Uh, They give us one or two officers, which the officers, they have to be there anyway. So it's a win-win for the prison systems to let nonprofits come Mm -hmm. in with the resources that we bring from the nonprofit uh, community. And North Texas is probably one of the most giving communities in the world. Unfortunately for me, my job is extremely tough to raise money for men who are in prison because the sentiment is they've committed the crime, Mm. let them do the time. And so there is that sense of, you know, uh, lock them up and throw away the key. And so I'm really not approached by people unless they are directly impacted with someone that's incarcerated. Mm -hmm. Other than that, we really in our society want nothing to do with men and women who have gone to prison. And we have to remember there are still a lot of innocent men and women that are in prison. If they were to release the men and women that were in prison for uh, the simple drug crimes like marijuana, Marijuana, which is almost legal in a lot of places, Mm -hmm. you could almost empty some of the prisons here in 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 texas and save the taxpayers a lot of money uh because of that yeah see that's speaking that's wisdom brother like that's (laughs) that's a whole other argument that's a whole well it goes back to what you said earlier (laughs) about incentive structure of the prisons of Mm -hmm. revenues generated by keeping Mm -hmm. them full they're not they can't make money if they don't have anybody in there so it's like it's like catch 22. Why would I want to rehabilitate them if they're, you know, that just means they're never coming back. That's mm. the conspiracy. Yeah. And the amount of money I get paid per bed. This is a business and mm. I'm in business to make money. money. Yes. And if I'm going to invest in this superstructure that you call prison, your job is to keep me full. Right. We have this contract. Right. So I guess know, I never I, thought of it that you way. You know, a question I would have is, is that open to the public? Uh, who's invested in, in these prisons? Oh, yes. And you, you would can. be surprised at the names of people who have invested in prisons. Wow. <sighs> Not invested in the prisons to help rehabilitate people, but invested in to grow profit. Profits. For profit. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That's Prison for profit. So the term institutionalized, what does that mean to you? For me, that's a term that's kind of generated in society Mm -hmm. uh, by people who know very little about the prison structure. No one wants to be institutionalized, but it is uh, what it is. Mm -hmm. Uh, Those guys know what they have to do to get through on a day-to-day while incarcerated. Uh, Mind you, prison is a dangerous place. Mm -hmm. It's a very dangerous place. It's so easy once you've been arrested to be rearrested once you're released back into communities. Um, parole systems that are there to help, uh, and they do the best that they possibly can. But a lot of guys would much rather do their time than to come out on parole mm-hmm. because they, they see that as a trap. It's so easy to get locked back up when you're on parole and so we help those guys with that as well you know the guys have the gps monitors on them i I didn't share this story with you guys so i pastor a church here Mm -hmm. in 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 uh, dallas and so many years ago uh 18 years ago my father-in-law my uh, wife's father Mm -hmm. spent 29 years in prison so she didn't grow Mm -hmm. up really knowing her father Mm -hmm. her mom was the breadwinner of the family and so I had just started in prison ministry, and I get this letter from her father, and uh, he shares with me, hey, I am maybe up for parole. Now, mind you, he had 
a uh, life sentence for a murder. Mm. Uh, he actually committed two murders, confessed to the second one after he had did some time in prison. And uh, so they gave him another life sentence and they ran it concurrent and sent him back to prison. And I told my wife, I can't say that I'm in prison ministry and your father is asking us for help mm. and we don't help him. Mm. Uh, and she said, OK, let's help. And so we wrote a letter and they released him to us. But he came home with this huge anchor monitor uh, around his anchor. And so the first time he goes to church with us, pants leg comes up, this thing's on his anchor and it's blinking. And I remember a little girl seeing that. I'm thinking, Lord, here's the whole cool. congregation. Because <laughs> now I got to explain Explained this. It, right. But he was sort of the gatekeeper, he opened the door for our church to understand the plight of prison. Mm -hmm. They fell in love with him. And now our church is 50% felon. Mm, no and way. when men come home from prison, there is no one that's going to hide their purse, shun their children away. We are a, a family there. And it's one of the most beautiful things to see, uh, to see these guys come together. And once they are assimilated into the church life and church body, mm -hmm. they tend to stay because they feel a place of ownership. You know, it's different when you do uh, church in prison. Right. Most of the guys come home. One of our guys, we had a pastor to tell him because he has tattoos that this might not be a good place for you. Mm. And, and that kind of breaks my heart right. because they'll preach Paul, who was a prisoner. Mm -hmm. They'll preach Jesus, who was a prisoner. Mm -hmm. They'll pe preach John, who was a prisoner. Right. Yet we don't want to have anything yeah. to do with prisoners. Mm. Right. That's, a, that's why it gives a lot of people such a bad taste, the, the church community, because mm -hmm. that's what church is about. It's about getting getting your, you know, Getting in, getting dirty and getting down with people and and loving on people. Yes. And yet we go and we think you know we can sit in the pews and sing and do our one hour a week and then we're good. Right. But what you guys are doing is you're living the actual gospel, which is Jesus' love, and you're going and you're loving on these people that that the world has forgotten about. Yes. That's church. Yeah. That's something that we all want to be a part of. Yesterday I had the privilege to uh, two men. One of them had gone through our program. He's trying to reconcile with his wife. So they're sitting in church on yesterday. Um, the message goes forward. She stands up to give her life to Christ. The husband who was in my class in prison, now he's not unequally yoked with his wife. She's a believer. Mm -hmm. He's a believer. It's moments like that that make me say, you know, thank you, Lord. I yeah. really get to see true life change. You know, mm -hmm. you can go to church on a typical Sunday it's the same old check the box thing. Mm -hmm. I get to really see true life change. I mm -hmm. get to see these guys, uh, families come back together, and it's one of the most beautiful things. And so, as I was saying earlier, trying to uh, get churches involved mm -hmm. on some level with men and women coming home from prison or trying to get community involved, because these men, they're going to come home, whether you like it or not. The right. question is, how do you want them to come, come home? back? Yeah. Asset or a liability? Right. Well, we want them to come back and be an asset to our community mm -hmm. and not a liability. Absolutely. And that starts where we meet them. And if you would look at Jesus, Jesus did not spend all of his time in the synagogue. He met people where they were. Right. He met Peter on a fishing boat because that's where Peter was. Well, the greatest fishing hole in Texas is in prison. Mm. That's why I invite people to come. That's strong. That's so good. <laughs> so what's the name of the church? One more time. House of Prayer Word Outreach Church. We're at 4209 Samuel Boulevard at Ferguson and 30. And here's something real cool. Every third Saturday morning, we have a breakfast for the formerly uh, incarcerated uh, and, and their families. Mm -hmm. And so every third Saturday morning at 9 o'clock, we get together there and we have a beautiful breakfast. We have one of the best cooks uh, in North Texas, Brother Tobias. He cooks mm -hmm. a breakfast for us. And then you guys, if you ever are privileged to come out, yeah. you get to hear some of the most powerful testimonies oh, of yeah. God's redemption mm -hmm. and God's love. We're and, coming. Uh, just yeah. make sure if you if you want to come, come out and mm -hmm. uh, just share that time of fellowship with us. and. And see how God is really moving in the lives of these men. You almost have to see it to believe it. I love it. I yeah, love it. Two, strong. two things. How can how can people get involved with Rod Ministries? I'm assuming you just go to the website. But but what are some ways that people listening today can get involved? Well, you know, it's so amazing. We we had a young lady from PCPC, Kelly McAtee. I never forget who uh, wanted to get involved in prison ministry. Her and her husband. And the first thing that she did was she saw a need, and the need was uh, a a welcome home backpack. 
And mm. so she would pack a uh, high jeans, towel, notepad, pencil, and these welcome home backpacks. And so that became sort of a tradition for Rod that every man coming home would have this welcome home backpack, mm -hmm. new sheets, new pillowcases. And so you can get involved with something as simple as packing a backpack for one of our guys, buying bed sheets. You can get involved with the Saturday morning breakfast coming mm -hmm. out and being mm -hmm. a part of these guys' lives. You can get involved with going into prison with us. It's not open now for the public to go in, although we have started our classes back. You can get involved that way. We have a house meeting, real cool. Every Tuesday night it's called Where You At? Bad English, good emphasis. Mm -hmm. And so in the <laughs> Where You At? meeting, we sit around in a circle, and I would say, Darren, where you at? And right. you have to kind of share your struggles, what you're going through, what mm. you're dealing with, your highs, your lows. And that way we get to know where everyone is at. And if I'm sitting there, I got to tell them, you know, uh, Sister Park didn't cook dinner for me today. And I'm kind of mad at her or whatever mm. I may be going right. through in life. Mm -hmm. uh, if guys are in what we might call relapse mode or um, thinking about going back to using mm. They'll share that during the group meeting, mm. and we say what's said and where you at, stay at where you at. But we have probably 10 members from community that comes out and be a part of that group. So you can be a part of encouraging that group of mm. men because all of the guys from all of the houses – uh, come to that particular meeting, and so you can get involved with that. And there's just so many ways that one can get involved other than going into prison. So when people think prison ministry, I gotta, I have to mm -hmm. go into prison. prison. No, right. you don't have to mm -hmm. go into prison to be involved. Yeah. Right. You can also be involved by giving time, talent, treasure. Right. Uh, it takes resources to run a, a ministry uh, like this, and prison is not real popular, so you can get involved that way. Yeah. That's www.rodministries.org if you're interested in getting involved, so go visit that website. What does the future look like for Rod Ministries specifically? I'm so excited about what the future of Rod looks like. See, my goal right now was to be in, in 10 prisons by this time. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had a slight bump in the road, but the prisons are opening back up. Uh, we are about to uh, purchase a new home, a fourth home, oh. where men can come and live. And we, in our homes, we don't want to model anything that looks like uh, prison, so we don't do bunk beds. We won't overcrowd the guys. Mm -hmm. And whenever our uh, outreach ministry grows, we just add another home. Mm -hmm. We want to give these guys the um, uh, experience of home ownership. Yeah. And so the only way that they can do that is to live in a home. And so, as I said earlier, our homes are immaculate. Uh, so we're still striving by 2022 to be in those 10 prisons. Uh, our, our desire is to continue to grow our inside ministry as well as our outside ministry. Mm -hmm. And then to grow and uh, reunite uh, uh, with those who were a part of our volunteer staff. We actually don't call them volunteers. We call them ambassadors mm -hmm. uh, because volunteers mm -hmm. are quit on you. But most of our ambassadors <laughs> have been going into prison with us. Five, 10, 15 wow. years now. So wow. we, we have some guys that are really faithful uh, going into prisons. Yeah. That's man. strong, man. Man, what, I mean, you, I, what, dude, you what are you doing, doing right now? Uh, it, it's unbelievable. I mean, yeah. we don't hear enough about mm -hmm. the positive. And uh, again, uh, I come from a background where uncle's incarcerated, best buddy. Um, man, 20, 20, did 26 years. And every Tuesday, I was taking that call. And every off season during the football season, I'd go visit him, and I'd take my kids to go visit him at the same time. So, uh, you know, what Darren, let me say this to you. You don't know uh, how powerful what you've done for him is. Yeah. The, the visit to, to bring your children out. Most of those men, the only visit that they'll get is from me. Mm. I become the family, mm -hmm. and we're in prison every single week, and that's the only visit that – those men again, See, yeah. you can be a pen pal to these guys because we're their only touch to the outside world. Mm -hmm. uh, the guys study you so much that one day I came in and, you know, Father's Day, my daughter always buy me new cologne. That's mm -hmm. the only time I get cologne. right? <laughs> right. Uh, so I changed the cologne and the guys noticed it. And that was I don't know if that was spooky right <laughs> but but we're the only touch to the outside world mm -hmm. and they notice everything hey when i get out of prison i want to dress like you and i'll say well you'll be dressing very poorly right, <laughs> right. but we're the only touch and so mm -hmm. what you did for uncle and what you did for friend is it's just amazing mm -hmm. and i wish more people would get involved yeah on that level. well we're gonna get involved 
Yes. We're going to get involved. This is the Darren Witches show. We'll get involved. Myself, Tyler, and Ben, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, usually we have we'll a third involved. co-host. He, uh, he bailed on us today. Yeah. But, yeah, well, we're absolutely going to get involved. <laughs> Our last question, and this is more for your personal life. You know, we spent a lot of time talking about the, the prison ministry. This is more back to your personal journey. And we ask every guest this. If you could go back to any point in your life and tell yourself one thing, doesn't necessarily mean you go change anything, but if you just go tell yourself one thing, where do you go and what do you tell yourself? I go back to uh, when my daughter was leaving high school, going to college, and I would tell myself to spend more time. Um, It's all right, take your time. Uh, So... Um, this child was just amazing. She was a pharmacist. Uh, after the birth of my second grandchild, um, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And, you know, I serve a God who heals. And I know that I still believe that to this day. But he chose not to heal her. And... I always wonder, did I spend enough time with her? Mm-hmm. And that's why I'm real big on getting these guys reunited back again with their families, because this is important. Yeah. And so I spend that time now with my grandchildren, but my daughter assured me, you were a good dad. And I got mad at God. I, I really did. Um, my wife, after put my daughter in the ground. She says, honey, you preaching in the morning. And I told her, if I don't stand up in the morning, I'll never stand up again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But God loved me through that. Even my anger, he loved me through that because I was mad at him Mm -hmm. because I would pray for people and they would be healed and the cancer would go in remission. But so I'm thinking, this is my child. Surely, you know, he's going to hear my cry. I've been obedient and loving and Man, throughout the prisons, and but he didn't, so I was mad at him. And so God and I had a long talk, and, and, and he asked me, he says, Jeff, <laughs> that's what he called me. Yeah. He says, have you ever missed a birthday? I said, well, yes. He says, I didn't. Mm. Mm. Did you hear every time she cried out? Well, no. He said, I did. And he says, you got to know that I love her more than you do. And I said, Lord, you're right. Mm. So if I was to change anything in my life, I would really savor the moments that I have with my children. Mm. Yeah. And, and I would tell anyone that there are always your children. No matter how old they are, they're going to always be your children. Enjoy the time that you get to spend Amen. with them. Amen. Yeah. Doc, yeah, that was beautiful, man. Yeah. No better way to end it. That was it. beautiful, brother. Thank you, man. We just we appreciate you, man, and and uh, we we got your back. Well, thank you, you know, sir. As men, we got to serve, and we always tell those that those that are listening, you know, there's no better place than to serve. It's to give mm-hmm. and give and continue to pour into other folks because you get so much out of it. Not, not only are you benefiting someone else, but you get so much. Yes restoration out of it man so we we really appreciate your time today yeah thank you for sharing that with us thank you for inspiring us thank you for the work that you do amazing thank you so much well and thank you guys for having us and uh just listening to the restoration story and i thank god for the both of you man and thank you for having me absolutely it's been an exciting time yeah Yeah. thanks again thanks guys